The Cheetah Girls 2 was Disney's inevitable 2006 follow-up to the first smash hit film, featuring the feline girl group that influenced the dreams of preteens and the fashion sense of Joe Exotic. We are talking about people who embrace a signature animal print the same way I embrace my oily skin yet dry hair. It's inconvenient now, but my body is gonna cremate so easily one day. I have all the same basic components as an old kerosene lantern. In this Cheetah-licious sequel, the girls take on Barcelona and each experience solid female driven character development in the areas of friendship, family, and of course, fashion. The final feminine essential that every young girl needs to survive. Right after food, water, and that pink pepper spray keychain that your mom gives you right before you go to college. So let's stamp your purple passport for a clip-by-clip -clip look at, at every outfit, performance, and character that disappears without explanation. If anyone has any information about where Chanel's little brother is, please call 555 Cheetah Girls, the number four ever. And then join me for another Another girl powerful installment of Clip Breakdown. Hello television viewers, my name is Nick. Thank you so much for joining me once again on my channel for another installment of Clip Breakdown. This is the playlist where we dive into our favorite movies, TV movies, and other content on the web and break it down into a little easily looked at clips so that we can say <laughs> or hearty har har depending on our mood that day. And today we're in a good mood, sweetheart, because we got Cheetah Girls 2. I would argue the superior film in the Cheetah Girls franchise. I'm just gonna throw that out there without having seen Cheetah Girls 3 yet because I know that that one doesn't have a key character. Not that Cheetah Girls 2 is perfect by any means. We've got missing characters, we've got a long script, and we've got a lot to talk about. But before we get into it, make sure you give this video a big thumbs up if you wanna see even more clip breakdowns or want me to finish the Cheetah Girls franchise. But most importantly, if you're new to my channel, I would love to have you click that subscribe button right down here. That way you never miss new videos from me. I upload two new ones every week, so turn on notifications and you'll always be the first to know when I've got a fresh new world tour that you're invited to. I would love to hit 200,000 subscribers this year, so if you could hit subscribe, I would so appreciate it. Also, I've got Merch Mama, and I've got a Patreon where you can access exclusive content like bonus clip breakdowns, virtual watch parties. This month we're watching Degrassi, as well as Zap starring Zendaya. But enough of that, let's look. So of course, Cheetah Girls 2 starts out with all of the girls at their Manhattan Magnet School in New York City, and they're performing for the seniors as they're about to become seniors themselves. That feeling when your denim vest is freshly embellished. Every time the Cheetah Girls encounter a new animal print applique, they ask themselves, hmm, but will this add enough bulk to my layers and layers of cowgirl costume? <laughs> I think my favorite part of all of these movies will forever be whenever Raven does a little stage dance like she's on a really slow treadmill. Let's get to that side of the stage. My neighbors are like, oh, he must be doing his gay stuff again. <laughs> the party's just begun. This is a solid number to open with. Are you feeling it? We can do anything, everything we wanna finally we get the chance. In my fantasies, this is where I would be introduced as the fifth cheetah girl by sliding down a fire pole wearing like a denim tuxedo vest and lucite heels. And I say, hey cheetah girls, did someone mention feline leukemia? My stage name would be feline Luke, middle initial E, Mia. Oh, you didn't know I was joining the cheetah girls? <laughs> Guess you weren't reading page six. It doesn't take much dialogue to realize there's gonna be a couple uncanny changes going on in this installment. Y'all are my girls, but I do miss Texas. Not as much as I miss your Texas accent that you had in the first movie. I actually loved that Aqua was this like Texas talking super genius cause it goes against type. But I think people with actual Southern accents called Disney and were like, um, we need her to stop. It was a little bit like her mouth was made of pudding. She's like, ah, ah, ah. not the best representation of a Southern dialect. So, and it was probably also annoying and she was like every time people see me on the street they think I have a southern accent and they get confused so they're like all right fine you don't have to do it for the second movie that's what I think probably happened the aqua days parade and barbecue I like it see in the last movie she would have been like Texas parade and barbecue and then like fired off pistols like Yosemite Sam they really toned down the Texan part of it for her. Right after the show, Galleria's mom accidentally exposes that Chanel and her parent are going to Barcelona for the summer. All because as you remember, Chanel's mom is dating a guy named Luke, who's like some big fancy guy. So now Chanel has to go spend the summer with him in Barcelona. I'm gonna have to spend the 
this restless summer hanging around Spain with her and her boyfriend. Only a teenager could complain about a free month long vacation to a Spanish villa. Chanel's mom is like, listen, I've been team Cheetah Girl all year long, so why don't you just pack up that iPod Nano I got you for Christmas and Cheetah chomp your lips shut. Of course, right off the bat, I was like, wait, why is Luke going to Spain? He doesn't live there. I thought Luke lived in Paris. No, he's from Barcelona. Oh, that makes sense. Except it doesn't. Our fact checkers have surfaced these clips from Cheetah Girls Uno. So another date with that French guy. I mean, Luke from Paris. Oh. Can we at least get the story straight on Luke's nationality before we fly out with him? He's like Spain, France, whatever I said, somewhere in Europe. By the way, I need you ladies to burn off your fingerprints before we leave. They never fully explain this change in Luke's nationality. And I get that when they wrote the first movie, they probably didn't know that the second one would be in Spain for whatever reason. But I wish they could have done something like made it so, oh yeah, his mom is from France, but his dad's from Spain. So they have a villa there that he has to sell since his parents died last year. They could even bring in some of that French Spanish fusion into the mansion that they go to later. And that would be like a little bit of interesting detail, similar to how Galleria's mom and dad were like, one was a black designer and one was an Italian accented guy. Like I loved that about that first movie. And that could have been like a similar feel if they had like Luke's French mom and a Spanish dad. But anyway, ignore all of those plot holes because we've got more plot holes to open up, like a vacuous black hole in space or the hole in the back of my throat where I drop gushers. If my mom marries Luke, she's gonna want me to move to Spain. Then in that case, we will find a way to fix this because no one is gonna tear us apart. Uh, that's interesting because I remember a guy wanted to record a demo with you in the last movie and it tore you all apart like a TV toaster strudel. But sure, whatever you say. There's a lot going on with a lot of characters in this movie, which I think makes for a good, well-rounded script. Even if the motivations are a little top level, like the mom wants uh, to be married by Luke, obviously she wants a proposal. They've been dating for a long time. But her whole thing is not only being obsessed with marriage, but just like the ring itself. I need the ring. Well, all right, Samara, don't climb out of the TV over it. I maybe don't love how this movie kind of normalizes that stereotypical female drive to be proposed to you and get the big ring. Also, the like fashion driven side of the whole thing is a little cheap, especially it's like, don't talk about how much you love fashion. You're all wearing velour. The Cheetah Girls are pretty bummed that they're gonna be broken up for the whole summer. Well, my professor's doing research on structures of membrane proteins at atomic resolution. I guess I could glom into that. Aqua, if you don't get back here with that Annie Oakley, Texas toasty talk from the first movie, then I'm gonna pretend to be Dorinda in my next Cheetah Girls dance session. So when I carelessly backflip off the fire escape, that's on you. The girls all wish that they could come along to Barcelona because they feel like that's where they could make things happen for the Cheetah Girls. So they wish upon a shooting star and the wind magically blows open a magazine to a perfectly convenient like action. It's an ad for the Barcelona Summer Music Festival. Featuring a new voices competition for undiscovered talent. The deadline was last week, guys. Girl, you tripping? I'm about to call up Barcelona right now. Gallery is like, hello, Barcelona. We need an extension on your talent show. Ma'am, this is an emergency hotline for people seeking asylum. I'll just tell them all that when it's not four o'clock in the morning over there. Never once will this movie be concerned with time zones or logistics, except for this super crucial phone call dilemma, which was included in order to add a few minutes of runtime to the first act. I feel like this story is complex enough that we really don't need this type of padding. At least five different storylines going on in this movie, we don't need to see them take this little cat nap in the first 10 minutes. We haven't even gotten to Spain yet, mama. Get me on the plane to Spain so I can see the rain fall mainly on the plane. Name that tune, Julie Andrews. <gasps> For whatever reason, the girls have to sleep till 4 a.m. and then they call Spain and they get their shot. She's saying we're too late. She's saying apply next year. Okay, we'll apply right now. Thank you, sisters. We are sisters. We stand together. We make up one big family, though we don't look the same. That's a long distance phone call in 2006. You know the person on the other end was hearing. <laughs> But somehow that works. The lady's like, okay, listen girls, if you get to Barcelona, you can meet with the director next week. And they're like, yes, we did it. So now they all have a reason to go to Barcelona together. We're gonna make this work. When we get to Barcelona, we have to promise each other that we are going to work hard, we're going to concentrate, and then nothing and no one can break us apart. Galleria must have been holding her copy of The Secret upside down or something, because every time she says something like this, the opposite happens. Stop making general predictions right before an adventure. It's not gonna play out well. So the girls make their case to Galleria's mom and Dorinda's mom. No, Chanel's mom. Oof, I'm gonna mess up these names all the time. In this conversation, we get a few more details, like Galleria's dad is 
in Hong Kong for this movie, so we won't be seeing him. Arriva Derchi to the Italian daddy. To the Italian daddy. <laughs> Dorinda's like, my foster mom's cool with it. Aqua's like, my parents are rich, they don't care. They've got the airline miles from the Hong Kong dad. This could change all of our lives. It really could, the trip is almost free. We're right there. Uh, okay, feels like we could have cut away from that close up a few frames earlier. That felt more like a that's a raven facial expression than a Galleria facial expression, but maybe that's what they were referencing. Either way, I love all of the hoops that the script has to jump through to make it like the, convenient for these girls to go to Barcelona. They're like, we have airline miles. Luke has a huge house. We're gonna fly there with you. You're gonna supervise us. Like. They just had to like find all these convenient ways to make the trip seem feasible for these four girls. It didn't have to be that way. Like these girls are obviously super talented. They've been performing as the Cheetah Girls all through high school. Maybe they already won a scholarship to get to go to Spain like this. And it just so happens that it was perfectly timed so that Luke could host them. So, like even that would be a little bit more believable. But regardless, we got it all figured out. Chanel's mom is like, you're coming with us, Dorothea which is Galleria's mother. So now we have our whole core crew of Barcelona babes getting on the planes, mama. No, mom, do you think Toto's gonna be okay since we left him in the kennel? We'll call his personal tummy scratcher every day to check on Thanks. him. Wait, they wrote out the dad and Toto? Very interesting how all of the characters who got cut out were white. And didn't they both have Italian accents? I'm just kidding. It was obviously a scheduling issue. The actor who played the dad was probably doing another movie. And the actor who played the dog was probably dead due to the shorter lifespan of dogs. And just a few seconds of stock footage of a plane landing later, we are in Barcelona, baby. And the girls are ready to get down to what's important. Shopping! Barcelona in a day, I am exhausted. Girl, you went to one postcard store. I know this movie didn't have like unlimited budget, but even just a stock footage montage of Barcelona would have been a little more engaging. Or they could have diverted some of that budget towards like, oh, some glamour shots of the girls at some pretty landmarks being like, ooh, -hoo, and uh -huh. But I get it, busy shooting schedule. Still, I'm pretty sure that last picture was just the front of the rental car place. As these girls are whining and dining, they meet this other character who seems to follow them throughout the movie. Oh my goodness, have you ever seen anything that was too perfect? No, that's not something I'm gonna find in my guidebook. Wow, these girls are horny for Gautier circa 2011. So this guy comes up to them and starts playing the song, uh, piano, cantar. <laughs> and um, the girls get into it. They start singing along. You can breathe in the music this city makes. Move by the rhythm the gypsies play. Whoa, 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 whoa. You don't get to use that word just because you love wearing a peasant blouse and a boho skirt. Bring it in, doe. I love this song though. The girls start touring the city with the help of their new guide. Gallery is off getting songwriting inspo from every single thing she sees. Rooftops, cobblestones, a sick bird. That old lady needs help. They're seeing everything the town has to offer, baby. Fruit carts, garbage cans, sidewalks. Why did they approach those old men like they were zoo animals? They're like, look cheetahs, it's Ponce de Leon and Americo Vespucci. Also, why does that guy smell his fingers after he touches his hat? He's like, yep, my head wound is still infected. Not only are the girls running and seeing the most beautiful parts of Barcelona. Hey, that's not what acoustic guitars sound like. And I would know because I've been a groupie for like dozens of bearded folk musicians. What? I love the feeling of calloused fingers on my body. Play me like your dead grandpa's six string. I love this when they're just like, let's, we're still walking down alleys, freeing our mind. Okay, who told Raven to go peeking inside random basement windows? She's like, ooh, a Spanish sewer grate, que fascinante. No, sweetheart, stay above ground. We're not trying to go to Narnia, crouching down there. We get some lovely cinematography here. A big step up from the first movie. Listen to that vocal from Raven. She's such a good singer. We gotta strut like you mean it. Free your mind, it's not enough just to mean it. Come on, come on, come on. Wow, 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 what you kapow? Come through with that glamorous golden hour shot. What a refreshing change of pace. It makes it feel like all the first movie's exteriors were shot on like a cold, cloudy Tuesday. Even the dog looked depressed. That's me and my gay friends going to Mickey's West Hollywood when it opens back up. Actually, that's what we'll feel like. It will actually look more like this. Who's ready? 
The girls finish their song with this new mysterious longed hair to did friend, and they get to exchange names. Encantado. Thank you for showing me your Barcelona. It's beautiful. I'll see, see you again soon. Bienvenidas a mi Barcelona. I think that was Spanish for, hey, you each owe me 10 euros for the walking tour. I'm in Barcelona. That guy's name is Angel, but they call him Angel because they are from Amaricar. Amaricarn. Amaricarn, the city of all the corn. The Cheetah Girls finally get to Luke's Casa where he has, it's like a huge house. Like this is an unreasonably big house. This guy must be the royalist royal in the royal world. They have like a full-time live-in staff member who's showing them around. The girls seem right impressed. Metro passes are on the dresses. Please see me for anything else you may require. Damn, Dorinda, why did you go straight for that plain white candle? You never seen one of those in New York? She's like, my foster mom won't let me have these because I keep setting her couch on fire. Oh. In the next scene, we first meet Luke, who seems like a really sweet guy who's not at all French, very Spanish. So what's up, first movie? And everyone seems to really like him. He's super generous and sweet and a great host, but Chanel's still very cagey towards him. She's like, ugh, don't touch my face with your stupid gross hands. I can see the dried <laughs> under your fingernails. <laughs> Why did I say that? Anyway, the girls have to go to um, their meeting with the director of the New Voices competition. And he's a tough cookie. <laughs> we actually have a CD. What have you prepared to sing? Surely you didn't assume you would be entered in the contest without a proper audition. You think I woke up early to get this stunning, gorgeous blowout just to listen to your CD? <laughs> Spits on them. Why does this guy look like he's playing the 1970s version of himself in a sitcom? Just curious. Anyway, the girls are like, it's okay, we didn't plan for this, but we always managed to pull out a perfectly rehearsed performance in the middle of nowhere. So anyway, they sing a little bit for him and the assistant is like, good news girls, you are in. Some of the people have Spanish accents in this and sometimes they're just British. So, okay. Previously, Luke had mentioned Oh, I've got um, an associate of mine who's going to make himself available to guide you around for this trip. <gasps> Ooh, here he is. Senor Luke, he sent me here to assist you. I'm Joaquin. Hi, Joaquin. Was it hard stealing those sunglasses from Jack Nicholson? He mentions he's like basically a glorified intern for his godfather, Luke. Senor Luke tells me you're in the new voices competition. The Dancing Cat is a teen club. Everyone who's in the festival tries to have their material there. You had me at Teen Club, a type of venue that I hear about often on Disney Channel, but I've only ever seen exist in casinos, cruise ships, or any other place that profits off of parents getting drunk. Like, does Barcelona really have a full-time establishment that can keep its business afloat selling Capri Suns to broke, unsupervised teenagers? All those young mouths touching, they better serve those drinks with a Briva on the rim and a Gardasil chaser. And we thought you were gonna send some stuffy old count to watch after us. Dorinda was hoping for some ancient Count Dracula D fresh out the coffin. But now she's like, okay, Joaquin, let's see what you got going on with your Mia Farrow haircut. You can tell right off the first minute Dorinda's sweating this guy. My biggest problem is keeping his nose in the books and his feet off the dance floor. You're a dancer? Oh, we have so much in common. Were you also abandoned as a baby by chance? Remember how I said that every character gets their own subplot in this movie? That includes Dorothea, which is Galleria's mother. At the beginning, she mentioned, oh, I could never design your wedding dress. I don't design anymore. But then when she's here in Spain, you can see her being really inspired by all of the beautiful fashion of Barthes. And while her and Aqua are out, she meets an old associate. Dorothea Bucri. Yes. It's me. Randolph. Randolph Hunter. Randolph from London, Randolph? And Randolph from Paris, Randolph. And Randolph from Milan, Randolph. Damn, Randolph, did you get a new face between all those countries? Why wouldn't she recognize him if they spent all that time together? He's like, you know, the Randolph who gave you his kidney? You said we'd always be friends. Randolph is like, oh, this is me and my wife's store, your old friend who you also love, who's, I guess, really famous. And it makes Dorothea feel a little inferior. Your couture line, you said you'd do it one day. Well, I have a small handbag oh. company, not quite couture. And also not quite what you were doing in the first movie, but whatever. Let's just keep saying stuff till we get to the big talent show at the end and we can sell those CDs. The wife of that man Randolph is named Arista or something like that. Era, 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 arabesque. I don't know. Pinch me. I am meeting the woman who designed the best jean jacket ever liberated from my mom's closet. Why does Disney continue to push the idea that a jean jacket is like the height of teen fashion? Do I look like I'm about to be thrown off a horse? No, because I've glued my butt to the horse so that I can look like a centaur. 
and centaurs don't wear a jacket. The designer kind of takes in Dorothea and Aqua and she's like, oh, let's like do some fun stuff and like make designs together. Aqua's obviously like super distracted by that right away. Meanwhile, Dorinda, she's like going off to meet Joaquin at his tango dance rehearsal and they have this big tango number, very nice, well choreographed. I feel like this movie was Kenny Ortega, let me see. Yeah, this movie was directed by Kenny Ortega of High School Musical fame. He also directed the first movie as well as Twitches, I believe. Twitches 2 and Twitches and Cowbells. Wow, we, we cover a lot of Kenny Ortega. So anyway, now the girls head out to the Dancing Cat Teen Club to see if they can scope out some of the competition. And as soon as they get there, we got some competition, baby, in the form of a really talented teen performer who goes by the name of Marisol. Abraham Lincoln preparing to give the Gettysburg Address. He said, four score and seven years of good luck to me. <sighs> also, this character Marisol was the first English role for the Spanish pop star named Belinda. I think the fact that she was already a pop star and an accomplished actress at the time explains why she has such a powerful stage presence during these performances. That is to say, nothing of the fashion she has on. Not the half cut off jeans and a blazer. Why was she assistant managing a wet seal when a bear mauled her? If I had to dance around all day with such wildly different leg temperatures, I would get pneumonia. That's how bad my body failed at evolution. I'm obsessed with this song. The future is what we make, so why wait? Hey, 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 why, why wait? This confetti was a mistake, because not only is it everywhere now, but I'm obsessed with it. I'm like, I'm out. <laughs> that almost went down my throat. <laughs> my Roomba will love eating that up later. <laughs> Somebody picked that stomped dirty hat off the ground and was like, oh, here you go. Right back on your noggin, Mrs. Babadook. Why wait? Ready to go now. Why wait? Eating my toes now. So the girls really love Marisol because obviously she's super talented. Oh, and then Angel on Hell, the guy who they met from, I look like Willy Wonka right now. The guy that they met from the tour type of thing, he gets on stage and starts performing a song and it's a lullaby, which happens to be one that Chanel knows. So the girls start singing together. Right after that, they meet Marisol's mother, Lola. These names, I'm so confused. And she's like another mom manager, just like the Sheeta girls have. And she's like, oh girls, try Trust me, I'm gonna help you get all the connections here. But as we see with her conversation with her daughter later, she might have some ulterior motives. Top of the morning to ya. I'm gonna throw this. Ooh, cool. It hit something. You have lost this contest twice already. You and Chanel together are magic. You heard the reaction at the club last night. You can win. Careful, I'm gonna be in charge of finding your elder care one day. For every potato chip you snatch out of my hand, your nursing home drops another star rating on Yelp, mama. I hope you like bed sores. Why wait? Heal all your bed sores. <laughs> <laughs> the girls get invited to a cool party that Joaquin says like you have to go to. Of course, Raven's starting to be like, well, when are we gonna rehearse for the new voices competition? But whatever, let's just stay quick and then leave. But the party seems glam. Okay, but who are the losers they made dance on the rocky seaside cliff outside of the party? They're like, we keep twisting our ankles and falling into the ocean, but we just love to be included. The girls seem really distracted as soon as they get into the party. Just like me with this glitter. What's that you got there? Oh, Marco made some tapas. Just a little snack. How come everyone in this movie gets some sort of relationship, storyline, or dramatic character development, but all Aqua gets is tapas? They also kind of make her suddenly obsessed with fashion, which they also did for Ella in Camp Rock 2. It seems like this kind of writing trick that they can usually take with a character who didn't get a lot of building out in the first movie, and they're like, oh, and she wants to be a fashion designer now. It's just this trope of being like, oh, I've always always been into fixing old cars. Oh really? You didn't mention that for the last 90 minutes where I knew you. Like how come she can't be obsessed with the space museum of Barcelona or whatever she's into there? She had a smart thing. Anyway, Dorinda and Joaquin have a little moment on the cliff being like, oh, we both have 
complicated family lives. It's great. Meanwhile, Dorothea is very suspicious of Lola. She's like, what is this woman up to with my girls? I better look into it. And then she doesn't look into it or like worry about it any further. She's just there to kind of rouse suspicion that there might be some reason to look out for Lola. But the bigger issue is that uh, Chanel's mom, whose name I can never remember, she's still waiting on that ring, honey. If you like it, then you should have put a ring on it. If you like it, then you should have put a ring on it. Somewhere in the world, there's this like video of me dancing to that in my f senior year of high school. Oof. This is where the conflict really starts to build for the third act. It seems like none of the girls want to focus and Gallery is having trouble getting them to rehearse. Doe runs off to another hip hop dance rehearsal. She's going to teach those tango kids how to do her moves. Chanel and her mom have to dress nicely to meet Luke's fancy family who actually turn out to be much more approachable and relatable than she expected. And Aqua is just generally off doing fashion things with that new designer and Galleria's mother. So Galleria is like, I'm gonna write a new song for this voices competition in Spanish. So she's she's kind of working on all of that overnight. I was up really late writing the song that I could Did hear. you see the designs your girlfriend did? Yeah, they're amazing. A tailored coat with leopard print accents? We're really pushing boundaries here. Why did the cheetah girls gaslight me into wanting to dress like the funkiest seventh grade math teacher? So uh, Galleria goes and finds Chanel, who is actually outside talking with Marisol. And on its surface, you might think that Galleria is getting jealous of this friendship, but I really feel like it comes across that she kind of just wants to rehearse for this contest that they all came here for, but no one seems to want to care about. Maybe you forgot the promise that we made. Here we go again. Always trying to control everything. Come on, Marisol. Galleria, why are you acting so jealous? I, Chanel, take the Marisol to be my new best friend and the primary character in my life story. So Galleria is obviously really hurt that not only is nobody working on this rehearsal for this important performance, but also she's being blamed like she's doing the same thing that she did in the last movie when it's really different. By the way, I love knowing how long this movie takes place over. They said at the beginning that it was a four week whole journey. And then in this conversation, they mentioned, I feel like this little one hour could turn into two weeks really fast like we've seen so we know that we're at the halfway point for their trip right now dorinda goes to meet joaquin for lunch by the way we mentioned he's in oxford business school right so he's trying to balance his dance life with his business life and that gives uh doe a little bit of pause Venga, la pasaremos bien. Vamos. <laughs> Me encantaría, pero no puedo. No, es que no quiera. i can Adios. why did you send your friends off <laughs> you didn't introduce me what am i okay to hang out with your dance friends but when the suits come out wait you wanted to eat lunch with all those flight attendants? I think they could have built the scene out to feel a little bit more exclusionary so that we understand Doe's hurt more. Like maybe he's like, oh yeah, these are my friends, blah, blah, blah. And they're all like speaking Spanish together and she can't understand and they're laughing and she's like, are they laughing at me? Like she just feels a little awkward. And then one of them is like, are you coming out to lunch with us? And she's like, ah, and he's like, no, no, we're gonna go do our own thing. That would have made it more clear that she's like, what, you're embarrassed of me? Cause the way this plays out where he's just over there being like, oh, well we had plans together it really didn't seem like that rude to me they seem boring it's fine but she's mad she's like this could never work because of that come on joaquin you can trace your ancestors back for centuries when i go home i'm going home to a foster family how come this girl puts on a newsboy hat and suddenly she thinks she's jack from titanic she's like we come from two different worlds you know your great grandparents names and all i know is wearing belts on the outside of my clothes like i feel like you should ask your english teacher to go into false equivalencies next year but regardless dorinda's like this will never work and she walks away from joaquin meanwhile galleria meets up with her mother and her mother is like guess what aristotle or whoever is going to be designing my dress that i make in their new spring collection so that's really great she's realizing her dream but galleria is like i got some news i'm going out you what chanel has found a friend in marisol marisol lives here and i think she's going to help her through the situation better than i can i have to back off mom Wow, sweetheart, your grandparents would be so proud of you. But I forgot to notify them when you were born and now it's too embarrassing to say anything. Anyway, safe flight. The mother is like, you're really mature for doing this. It shows a lot of maturity for the character and it's like she's grown up between the two movies and throughout this movie. That night, the parents let Chanel know like, sorry, gallery is gonna be going home, it's fine. She just feels like her time here is done. It feels like a very mature conversation. I like the parents always setting a good example in these movies for like healthy, 
we handling of things. Like they never really escalate to screaming at each other. She's that mad at me. We've all been distracted. I can't believe I wasted so much time. She thinks I dumped her for Marisol. Well, remember when you both skipped away from her singing a happy tune, holding hands? I love how Galleria was like, when we get to Barcelona, nothing can break us up. Then a week after the flight lands, she's like, you know what? the cheetah girls. Also, for some reason, this was the exact scene that I realized the actress who plays Aqua was also in the house bunny. She played the silent girl who ended up having a British accent. I was like, oh my God, worlds colliding. Never would have thought they were the same person. Anyway, let's get a quick vibe check from Galleria. It's over. Got it, thanks for keeping things concise. Also, the costume designer told Raven, so for this movie, we think you're gonna be wearing a lot of caftans. Your fashion inspiration is Oprah's day off. Chanel is also in on this little ballad of sadness, just singing from afar. Nice work, those are some very natural arm movements, especially for some sort of magical ice princess or wizard. Kenny Ortega said, uh, sweetheart, do you need something to do with your arms for this number? She said, no, why do you ask? I'm totally fine. Ooh. The next morning, the girls go to like apologize to Galleria, but she's already headed to the train station where basically she's going to be taking a train to meet her dad in Paris and they're gonna fly home together because he's coming home from Kong Kong, Kong Kong, Kong Kong, China. But the girls in the room, they had discovered her sheet music. So they're like, this is so good. Amidas, cheetahs, living the dream. Living the dream or standing at the train station in no underwear. Just curious. You had time to learn this new song, but no one wanted to throw on a sports bra just for comfort. I have to hold my breast just going down my front steps. That's just life. That's just, that's just being human. It's okay. They basically tell Galleria like, this is the best song you've ever written. You have to stay. So she's like, okay, I forgive you guys. When Marisol's mother hears about this, that Galleria didn't run off, and Marisol is like, what did you want me to do? Send her off on the plane myself? They have to come up with a different plan. This is where the movie really feels a little slow to me. Like this, again, is an hour and 40 minutes, and a 100 minute movie, and I feel like they have to quickly wrap up a lot of conflicts in this last 40 minutes. For example, then we have Chanel walking up to the corner and realizing her mother is afraid that the reason Luke hasn't proposed yet is because she knows that Chanel hates him. So Chanel has to go apologize to Luke and be like, I would be honored to be part of your family. I totally misjudged you, which I guess was exactly what he needed to hear because then he proposes right away. Again, all of this feels really crammed into five minutes. So I kind of wish that it could unfold a little bit more slowly somehow, but it's okay. Congratulations! And I think I know the perfect girl group to sing at your wedding. It's a barbershop quartet made up of female convicts. They have such beautiful, aggressive voices. I almost feel like if they could have moved this Chanel making up with Luke to before she made up with Galleria, like even if Galleria was on her way to the train station and they were like, we gotta go stop Galleria. And then on the way, she like saw that her mother was crying and overheard this and was like, gotta make things right with Luke before we go. And so there's like some urgent to it as well. And then maybe this uh, proposal doesn't need to be actually part of the movie because frankly, it's like, okay, we could have just, we could have just cut to the wedding later on and known that it happened, you know? But here's what we get. Meanwhile, um, Dorinda is at a dance rehearsal for the Cheetah Girls for this new voices competition and Joaquin comes up. I didn't introduce you the other day because I couldn't afford to take you where they were going for lunch. And besides, I just wanted to be with you. But I thought that you're- Yes, I am a count and broke. She's like, oh, I should have known you weren't a wealthy, privileged royal from the moment I saw your haircut and teeth. So Dorinda's basically like, oh, I shouldn't have judged you like that. I'm so sorry. And then they make up, so their romance is back on track. And then the Cheetah Girls make it to the competition. No, sorry. <laughs> See, this is where it gets confusing. They don't go to the talent show. They go to the warm up at the Dancing Cat so that they can practice a warm up song. We get like an additional musical number, but I always forget that this isn't the final number because it feels really like it should be at this point. Again, the costume designer said, so Raven, your waist is about three inches larger, so we're gonna have to put you in a gaucho pant and suspenders. Like, if you don't look like Nicole Richie, then we need you to look like the Hamburglar. I really hope that this all came from Raven choosing her own costume design, but why do I feel like it was more like Disney thinking, oh, a woman your size can't wear fitted jeans. 
like the rest of the girls in this group. Are you kidding? So after this performance, we get some more shenanigans from Lola, the mother momager. The owner of the club. Hey! Congratulations, ladies. That was a great show. Here you go. That's your pay for tonight's work. Girls, you can use it for expenses for the festival. Take the money. I'm starting to get real distrustful of Ursula here. What was it about Dorothea being like, I gotta protect my baby cubs, and now they're here getting paid under the table in Europe? I don't even know what a centimeter is. One of those weird cats Caterpillars. But whatever, the next day the girls are getting ready to go on stage for the New Voices competition. But there's trouble in Paradise. So the long haired director guy comes up and he's like, did you guys perform at the Dancing Cat last night? The girls each took 100 euros home for their hard work. Making them officially professionals. Now, it was my mistake, so don't- I'm very mistake. sorry. Now I've got to go slick this hair back into a ponytail because I'm headlining a magic show in Vegas tonight with my silent assistant teller. Right off the bat, you start to see that this probably had something to do with Marisol being shady. So, the cheetah girls cannot perform. Chanel knows a couple of my songs, right? Oh yeah, I think you taught me the one called Your Mom Played Us, featuring too many metallic accessories. Chanel is like, well, whatever, I'm not going on stage without my girls. And they're like, don't be so quick to say that. Like, someone's gotta represent the cheetah girls up there. Maybe you should just go perform so that we didn't come here for nothing. So they're all really bummed about it, but they take it on really maturely. They're like, whatever, Chanel will sing the song with the two of them. And then Chanel gets some nice news about her fears about having to move to Spain after all of this. We're gonna live in New York? Yeah. Mm hmm After the wedding, Luke is gonna come and live with us. I wouldn't dare to break up the cheetah girls. Watch, a month into him downsizing to that tiny apartment, he'll be like, I'm ready to Yoko Ono these kittens and I don't care who cries about it. Also, you may remember Chanel's spunky little brother from the first movie. He doesn't get to meet his new family and they don't give a reason as to why he's missing because they don't know. He just didn't come home from school one day. But don't worry about it, the true crime subreddit community is on it. So the girls go back and they give back their 100 euros. And when they're walking away, Angel, the guy with the long hair who plays the guitar all the time, actually sees it. So later on, back at the New Voices competition, the parents are mad. I'm very sorry that they had to suffer on my account, but these girls are flexible. They're going to make it, don't you worry. I have no doubt. Your future, however, is still a little murky. She just threatened to ice Lola in front of the whole room. But we have some salvation because Mr. Magic Man comes up with some news. You arranged for the Cheetah Girls to get paid for their performance at the Dancing Cut. Who would say such a thing? My nephew. Angel? The Cheetah Girls overcame another obstacle through the power of convenient, unlikely character relations. All these chance encounters during one trip, is Barcelona just a single street? I think they all believe they're in Spain, but this is really just like a large El Pollo logo they all got lost in. So Lola's been called out. Now the rules clearly stay. I don't need you to tell me the rules. I wrote them. Angel is sneaking up behind her like, are we gonna jump this lady or what? The Cheetah Girls get to jump on stage instead of Marisol, but Marisol actually doesn't even care. She's just happy she gets to pig out on fried food like her mother won't let her. So she, even she's feeling the liberation. And that's when Galleria gets to jump on stage and say hello to the crowd. This song is dedicated to Barcelona, where I found an angel around every corner. Thank you, Barcelona. They're like, we speak Spanish here. Galleria felt that her what I did for summer vacation monologue was so important that she had to tell it to the audience in a language that only a third of them could understand. But the girls break out into a very cool Spanish influenced number. And that hat that Galleria's hair is coming out of is so cool. And it wasn't even meant to be that way. They cut off the top of the hat because it wouldn't stay on her head. You can see in the sketch, she has her full hat. But I think it looks even better as a visor. And here we get the Oxford business guys. <laughs> That's me showing up for jury duty, excited about the free Quiznos. The budget is so right on this sequel. If you remember, for Cheetah Girls 1, the final number took place next to an open sewage hole. And then after this big number, you know we had to end on a white wedding. How do you say, don't look at the camera, Joshua, in Spanish? And please try to preserve my unpleasant tone in your translation. They just kind of do a soft little montage of the girls singing beautifully at a wedding and uh, singing to the camera, touching their hats. <laughs> enjoy, 
You could tell they were already positioning Chanel to be the new lead singer of the Cheetah Girls because by the end they literally have Raven in the corner crouching behind a tree. She said, I'm not doing the next movie. Shh. What do you guys think of Cheetah Girls 2? Was this Barcelona adventure even better than the first for you? Let me know in the comments below. Also, let me know what movies you would like to see me cover next and give this video a big thumbs up if you wanna see Cheetah Girls 3 World Tour. But most importantly, if you're new to my channel, I would love to have you click that subscribe button right down here. That way you never miss new videos from me. I upload two new ones every week. Can you believe it? So turn on notifications. That way you'll be part of the Nick D crew and you'll never miss new videos from me. Also, I've got merch available for purchase, plus a Patreon where you can download bonus episodes, monthly watch parties, and other fun extras. You guys are all the greatest. Thank you so much for feeling the music of the Spain with me today. I will see you next time.